Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Jared Neve, one half of the Dynamic Neves Knives YouTube channel. Jared and his lovely wife, Kara, started Neves Knives five and a half years ago at their kitchen table. And now they enjoy an audience of nearly a quarter million subscribers. And it's no wonder why. They offer a comprehensive picture of the contemporary folder market. They host numerous live shows every week, encouraging conversation and community. And they're just cool people. I got a chance to meet Mr. and Mrs. Neve at Blade Show last year and really enjoyed it. And look forward to catching up with Jared right here. But before we do, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, you can check out what we have to offer on Patreon, like the extra interview hot takes with Jared we'll get after the show. Uh, just go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Jared, welcome back to the show, sir. What's going on, Bob? Oh, man, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Amazing intro, by the way. Amazing. Oh, why thank you. Why thank you. You can you can put that on your resume. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so uh, before we get uh, cracking, I got to ask you what you're carrying today. What's in your pocket? Um, actually, so right at the moment, I've switched a couple different things, but I have the 80 20.5 with the reblade from Transparent Knives with the magnet cut at 64.5 HRC, deep hollow grind, amazing knife. Now it's like basically 100% USA made aside from the locking mechanism oh, um, that it was and the clip that was original. But um, I have here a bunch of, or like four different versions of the rock walls that are going to be dropping mm. on the 23rd. Um, they're all special editions. And if you look, they all have like something unique. Like this one has a bullseye. Oh yeah. And it's almost like a gunmetal blue, but there's three other ones. Like here's like an army green one with the i'm on focus oh man there yeah goes. those got, like, the, are... the dots on there yeah it looks really cool but there and then there's two other options there's one with a um an anchor and another one for like a construction worker it's got the the hazard sign oh <laughs> that's cool but they're really cool though so and i'm really excited about the maverick that's going to be coming and it's but... not going to be too much longer after these drop not too much longer, um, as far as I know. So, so the Maverick, that's the Richard Rogers design, right? Yeah, yeah, it's their new one. It's it's a little bit larger than this. I mean, I haven't tried it. I'm hoping I get it on the channel before it drops. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it looks really cool. They're going to be doing their version of the crossbar lock, and also their magna cut on that is going to have the higher HRC because these ones were already done so there, there was nothing that they could obviously do about them but since this one is obviously new they're able to uh he treated a little bit better or a little bit higher hrc nice uh so a little bit of a philosophical question here on your uh, 80 20.5 yeah. it's been totally rebuilt and now it's basically completely american made whereas it was yeah. originally built in taiwan so is this the same knife it started as this is a, a question my daughter was asking me about not at all. Ships. It's not, not even a little bit. It, it's completely redone. Well, first off, it was originally the, the FRN scales or whatever. Mm -hmm. I personally don't really like FRN. There are some knives that have FRN that are okay, but this one's full titanium now. And the blade, the reblade, because of the geometry, I mean, this one is 10 thousandths behind the edge, and it's like 10 thousandths for a long ways up. So I could sharpen wow. this thing to death, and it's still going to be 10 thousandths. So it makes it to where not only is the blade shape, in my opinion, more useful, but it is so, so much more slicey. All right. So just sitting here listening to you evaluate this knife um, and kind of being uh, along for the ride the whole time. Obviously, you've learned so much uh, in the period of time you've had this channel. Well, why did you guys start the channel in the first place? Um, well, well, two reasons. One. Um, we found the community and I was like into knives. I've always been into tools and stuff. I've you know, done construction my whole life. So pocket knives was always just like a, a part of me. I've been carrying a knife since I was like five years old. So when I found the community, it was something special to me. Like I loved it. Like I dove in so deep 
and it was like I couldn't watch anything else but knife stuff. And then Kara, because she was right there, she started like getting interested too, you know, and um, she saw how fascinated I was with like the build qualities and the machining and stuff like that. And then I I loved it so much. I, I knew like that if I started a channel and I, I was serious about it, there was a possibility I could basically run a business doing what I love. So. So, but when you started, obviously you can't just, you can't just uh, go pro immediately. No, I was but, willing. So with the way I looked at it was I'm, I'm willing to put in two years of work without getting paid. And that's basically how it went. Once I started taking it seriously, which was about six months to a year in, because at first mm -hmm. I was working really difficult jobs and stuff. So it wasn't as easy for me to do it, but I figured I can start building my catalog of videos. And then at a certain point, I'm going to like seriously take it serious. And I did. And then once I did that, once I started taking it like really serious, that's when it started blowing up. Yeah. Just I think out more content and stuff, you know? And I think the knives uh, you've always presented have been um, obviously things that you're passionate about, mm -hmm. uh, but also things that uh, a lot of us are passionate about, folders, action, getting specific. Um, you know, it, it seems like uh, I, well, I started watching nothing fancy videos way back in the day, and, yeah. and that was before bearing action and stuff like that. And right. he, would, he would talk a little bit about that stuff, about the action, but... But these are things that kind of came along the way. And a lot of them I became aware of from watching your videos. There, there are a lot of things that I look for now in folders, specifically. Little details, right? It's the little yeah. details that matter. And, and that's also something that because when I review a knife, if it's not my style, it's not my style. But that doesn't matter. That has nothing to do with the video. It has to do whether or not if this knife, who it's for. Is it built well and does it do the job that it's advertising as well? Kind of like, like a say, if it's a light duty folder, like just for an example, and it has a super thick blade and geometry, that just doesn't make sense. So it has a hard use knife uh, blade with a light duty handle. So the handle can handle the pressure that the blade's going to have to take. So like something like that, like it just doesn't make sense. But if it's a knife that's not my style, I still want to review it for the person that it is and let them know whether or not it's built well, does it work and does it work well with what it's advertised as, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you can, you don't have to love the thing to evaluate it and to know yeah. whether it's a good type of that thing or not, you know, like, yeah. uh, up front, I was saying um, one of the things I love about your channel is that you always have like uh, a, a brand new, fresh and specific take on a brand new and fresh knife. You know, mm -hmm. um, the contemporary uh, modern folder world, like you've got it on lockdown and um, your reviews uh, and, and several other people uh, have um, inspired this term for me, trusted voices. Like if you say uh, the access to the lock bar, for instance, that's something I look for now all mm -hmm. the time. And yeah. I, I actually think about, it. and it's something I never thought about before. Maybe I was like, oh, this is uncomfortable, but I, I didn't right. think about the solutions or what have you. Yeah. Well, also when you start getting to a certain price, there's little things that are acceptable at a lower price, but when they start getting higher, it's like, what am I paying for? Like, am I paying the extra money to, to not get this? Right. Because I think the, those things are where the extra money starts coming from. Of course, the materials get better, but then it's like, what did you do with the materials? You know, and I this I hate it when I'm trying to disengage a knife. I think a, a knife should disengage just as easy as it engages. Like, however good the action is, closing it should be easy too. Like, it's you shouldn't have to skip off of it. You shouldn't be frustrated. It shouldn't be painful. So, and you know, like I said, if it's a little bit more on a budget side, it's a little bit more acceptable. But there's no reason why budget knives can do it right. Why can mm. an expensive knife do it? You know. Yeah, it's almost like there's no excuse at this point. You know, I got a, a craftsman knife at uh, at Lowe's not too long ago, and it had all the hallmarks of a three hundred dollar knife. It had right. bearing bearing action, it had a deep hollow grind. It had all these wow. things. And I was like, That's damn, great. man, this is a twenty buck. Yeah, so, listening. so yeah, exactly. They're listening, yep. and yep. and it's channels like yours, definitely with your reach that that has a lot to do with that. And and that kind of information raises all ships. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that and uh, I love it when the companies contact me before the model ever even comes out. Maybe it's a year out or something. They'll contact me and just have me take a look at it really quick and say, hey, um, what do you think? Is there something we can change on this? You know, and I'll tell my honest opinion like, um, yeah, you should move this or change this or, 
you know, allow this or whatever. And then it makes it to where now this knife is going to be far better when it comes out than it would have been if they wouldn't have. So the, I mean, that is, that's an incredible position to find yourself in. You know, I was, I was going to bring that up. Uh, I drew up some designs. I've, you know, I've drew, like probably everyone listening, I've drawn up a million designs. I sent a couple to you for your evaluation, just, you know, hand-drawn designs. And, and you gave me a lot of useful information. I was thinking maybe I should stick to fixed blades. That's what I really get, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't but, think so. I mean, if you, if you like folders and you're, and you like designing folders, I think go with it because, it's not like like if you do one that doesn't mean you can't do another you know it no, doesn't mean yeah. you can't do 10 you know the time can just keep going where you evolve into maybe a specific type because i guarantee i guarantee everyone will have your like aspects or like your designed influence kind of like like when you look at a ray laconico you almost always know when it's a ray laconico right you know it just speaks ray laconico yeah. so you know i th i think it's awesome to uh you know, to, to want to do that. I know I would love to do that too. I've, I've actually done a little something right now that's in the works. Uh, but, uh, it's not going to be for a while, but I'm wanting to do a lot more. I, I would love to be designing knives and, uh, you know, being involved in that type of way. I'm definitely not a knife maker, so I couldn't mm -hmm. do it myself, you mm -hmm. know, maybe in the far future, but, uh, but as far as like foldiers go, I'd love to design them. Well, I mean, you you really do get uh, not only through your own acquisitions and through uh, generous, um, you know, people who send things along for you to check out. But you you seem to have I mean, I, don't, I can't say this for sure, but you seem to have very good relationships with a number of different companies. And they know to send stuff to you, I would imagine, because you have great reach and you have a very thorough evaluation process. And uh, and that could be, you know, that's incredibly appealing to a company who knows that they've got their game in order. You know, yeah. but it, it, it yeah. can also be good for a company who's trying to get their game in order. So yes, how much right. how much of this consultation do you do? Uh, I pretty much do it on the on daily basis. Um, whoever contact, because I've, I've announced it many times over. Like if anybody ever has a design that they're thinking about and they just want to run it past me, or if it's a company that has questions or wants to reach out and see like, what could they do better? I'm always here and I'm always here to help. I advocate for the knife companies to do better and for the people to get the best quality product possible. So, you know, I need to be an asset in that way. And, and I like to be, I have no problem with it. Um, and it's better. Like there's a couple of companies I can think of right now that contact me on the daily basis with their models coming out and what they could change, what they could do better. And uh, the ones that have from the beginning have massively evolved like into something that's great now but when they started it might not have been so great you know they were good but you know just it's the little details you know well imagine you own and run a knife company or you're part of a design team and a knife company and you've got to keep your business afloat you've got all these details you've got to make sure you have materials you've got all of these concerns and then it comes down to the very very finite details of the knife, my God, by that it point. It could ruin head, it. it. Yeah. It could ruin it. Yeah. And your head could be swimming. Your mind might might not be in the detail of the access mm -hmm. to the lock bar. So sending it out to you and, and having having fresh eyes, especially mm -hmm. uh, yours, take a look at it, be yeah. very valuable. Uh, plus, uh, like, how much do you think the fact that you've seen 8 billion knives come across your desk has to do with it? Well, I think I think it's a really good thing because I've tried the good and the bad. You know, so because I have so much experience with bad and so much experience with great, it makes it to where I know usually right away exactly what's wrong. <clears throat> like I remember in the beginning, I didn't quite like there was like little details where it's like, eh, you know, this is kind of annoying or, you know, whatever. But but it wouldn't be that big of a deal to me as it is now, because now I know the difference and how big of a deal those little details are, especially in the long run, especially when you're, you're spending, you know, quite a bit of money. These little details are what's going to, when you get it in your hand, it's going to make the knife feel premium because you can make a premium knife mm -hmm. feel like a cheap knife without the little details. It's kind of like, I always um, explain, like we were just talking about with the lock bar access, the yeah. comfort of the lock bar as well, right? Like when you disengage a knife, how comfortable is it when you disengage it? Because if you, I don't know if you've noticed, but premium knives that are done very well, they're usually very comfortable right there. And they're nice and soft. They're they're easy to, to disengage, plenty of room. And that 
bit of comfort makes that knife feel even more premium. Now, if that same lock bar was sharp and annoying to disengage, it would take a premium knife and make it feel way lower than what it is. Yeah, it also it also makes you feel like they don't care. It's like you have hands. No doubt you're a human and right. you have hands. Did it feel good to you? Right. Did you and, try this thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. And and if you're a collector, and I am a I I am a collector and I've got a lot of knives and there are some knives I don't want to get rid of, but I also don't carry because I'm like, eh, I don't feel I'm like dealing with that way. today. I'm the yeah. same way. I have so many knives like I'll, I won't carry, but it's like I don't want to get rid of them. They're kind of nostalgic or maybe it's just like, you know, I have it in my collection and nobody else does, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and at some point you will open up the uh, the the Neve Museum of Cutlery, and you're going to need examples of yeah. as much of it. Yeah, right. or my other justification is is when society falls and I need to trade something for food, knives will be good. They you know? will be a very good currency. You can guarantee <laughs> that, actually. No I doubt about, about that. Too. <laughs> oh my God! Well, you you uh, you've talked about on your live shows and uh, how you grew up kind of on the rough uh, in rough neighborhoods, or or you dealt with some rough rough characters. I, I growing definitely up. grew up in rough neighborhoods. Yes. yes. So, uh, does the knife? Um, you know, for me, this is something I love about your channel as well. Mm -hmm. um, you are not. You don't. Um, wince at talking about knives as self defense items. No. That I mean, it's 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 it's. A, it's low hanging fruit. B, it's so obvious. And C, like it is something that is you have to consider. It's the only responsible thing. And yep. I'm not saying that you that you have yeah. to use it for self defense, but you have to right. know that you have a weapon in your pocket. Right. Well, I also I've seen it used so many times. So like I, I've seen some some very crazy things when it comes to firearms, knives, and you know weapons in general. So I understand like how deadly they can be or how, how messy it can be. Uh, but yes, you're, you're carrying a, a tool in your pocket and just like any tool, it can be used as, as a weapon. Now, historically speaking, of course, it was always considered a weapon and like basically a like multi-tool and it still is, it's a knife or it's a, it's a tool that you can use for multiple different reasons. And I like to always give um, this analogy, it's like, because most of the time people think that the self-defense is going to be a, a human on human attack. And in many cases, it might not be, it might be something where you're going to need to cut something to save something or someone's life. Like, uh, just for an example, like a dog jumps over a fence and it's got the leash on, right. You know, and it starts getting choked. If it's not a chain, you, you can cut it off maybe really quick. Or I give the example, a dog attacks your child. You, even if you have a firearm, you might not want to take that shot. Yeah. Right. Because you could hit your kid. So yeah. having a blade on you might be the better option or tending to somebody's wounds. You know, if somebody gets wounded and it's your partner or whoever. Right. And you need to tend to the wounds. You might need to cut the clothes off. There's so many examples of which, you know, you might need to cut a rope or something to save you or somebody's life. Like maybe on a boat, like you're on a, um, a boat doing fisherman stuff. And one of those lines get caught around you. Right. How many people die a year on those shipper on those um ships you know like with the crabs and stuff like that yeah. from ropes like the ropes catch them and tear them off the boat so like not you know there's so many examples where it might not just be somebody or a human attacking now of course that's always the thing too but it's nice to have a tool on you for the just in case and you know to to handle whatever purpose comes up yeah um uh, ernest emerson tells the story about how he was on an escalator and someone's uh, a kid's shoelace, shoelace got caught in the escalator yeah. and he came up and cut it and walked yeah. off. And as he was walking off, he heard someone say, who is that man with the knife? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You just I want to be that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then my, my wife and I ha have a little running list of movies where little folders save the day. Like without that mm -hmm. folder, you know, this, this character would have been lost. Right. Um, right. I, I love that stuff. And I, and I love, um, you know, I've done the, uh, a, a lot of uh, blade oriented martial arts. And for me, it's theoretical for you. It's a reality that you have seen in your past. It's yeah. part of your past for me. Um, it's, it's part of what I've done to make sure I'm not too much of a cream puff basically. And it's fed into my love of knives. I would um, argue that's even better because I think uh, it's important to, with anything, with any tool, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, like if you're going to carry a hammer and use a hammer all day, you better be driving nails and know how to use your hammer. Right. So whatever the tool is that you're going to be carrying, it's better if you do train practice and have 
some sort of knowledge of how to use it and also make it a habit because it, whatever the habit is that you have, that's what you're going to fall back to no matter what it is. Right. So if you're not used to practicing and training with something, then when crap hits the fan, you're going, you're not going to use it. You're not going to have a natural instinct to do whatever with it because you're just not used to it. Right. You always fall back to your habits. So, yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, you don't want to have to think in that moment. It's like in right. Maverick. I don't know if you've seen them. Everyone's seen Maverick, but in Maverick, he's telling, uh, he's telling his upstart fighter pilot, you know, don't think, just go up there and do it. You uh -huh. know, if you think that's when you slow down, that's when things get, um, right. and so you want to rely on your muscle memory. And so that's why you want to train. For sure. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't mean you have to take years and years of, of whatever, uh, you know, it, it might, it might be uh, years and years of a martial art. I should be specific. Yeah. Uh, it, it might be just a, a style of knife, like the, uh, like the civilian or, or, or a hawk bill or something that, that just takes gross motor motion, a pickle yeah. knife or something. Yeah. Uh, but what, how does that, that aspect of things filter into your personal taste, like that beautiful Rockstead or, or yeah. uh, so well, how, how does your taste get informed by that? Well, it does just because I've, I carry so many different knives, but I always have in the back of my head, always, and it, I just, I can't get away from this. So it's like, it's just like genetic. I always think like, if something happened, could I use this to, to save somebody or my own life? And if the answer is no, then I'll usually carry something else with it. That's something right. that I can do that with because I would hate it'd be nothing would be worse than coming into the situation and me having the tool on me, but the tool is not an acceptable tool for the job. And then I get screwed trying to use it or whatever, whether it's not big enough, whether the blade shape isn't good enough, you know, so I, I'd like to think that. Certain knives, and that, this is a reason why I also I love spear points. I love spear points for this exact reason, because it's such a versatile blade shape. It's a blade shape I can basically do anything with, whether it's poking, slashing, uh, pulling, right? I can use that, that shape so well, and I'm not trapped using it one way. That's interesting. Well, how, how does that feed into your taste in ergonomics? Uh, well, I think... Uh, that that's the reason why I love neutral ergos personally. Not, not saying that I don't carry other knives that are not neutral. Like I love the spider co Manix and you know, other knives alike, but my favorite, my absolute favorite is something with neutral ergos where it doesn't matter if I'm holding it backwards, forwards, a pinch grip, reverse, whatever, it's going to be comfortable and I'm going to be able to use it. That's my favorite. Like I said, I don't always carry that, but that would be what my optimal. Yeah, uh, that, that that all your descriptions remind me of that new Ray Laconico Civivi that I want to get my hands on. I got it right it, here. It looks beautiful, and and it's got that spear point. It's got oh, it's great. got a nice looking handle that looks neutral, but also in in standard grip, it looks like it melts into your hands. And they stepped up their quality with their micarta massively. Like this is a huge jump from their old stuff. I'm pretty sure I'm not hundred percent, but I'm pretty sure this is USA made my card. I mean, it looks like it. So well, yeah, no, this is a great one. I love the steel. I love the blade shape. The ergos are just, it's hand melting. Um, and yeah, if you want to try it, man, I'll, I'll send it to you. I mean, Oh, cool. Uh, I mean, I, I might just have to go buy one. You should, it, I mean, you, you're probably going to want to, after you try it, it's that good. Like to I, me right now, it's the, the best knife for 65 bucks. Wow. Okay. I, I just got the, I'm calling it the Watauga, but the Watuga or whatever. The Wataga or something like yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. I, I'm, I, I prefer That's to That's a good one too. Every, That's a great uh, one too. This is Sen Cut. This is, this is yeah. the, the third tier down on, yeah. on We Knives and man, it is so good. It is so, so good. good. And this is coming at a point where, where I was sort of deciding I'm going to get rid of all of my inexpensive knives and I'm going to focus mm -hmm. on what I, and, 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 and then I got this and I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to expand my high value, my high value collection. <laughs> it, uh, I, I do have a, an issue with this. It, it is, it is a problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's okay. It's a healthy problem. To have. It's a healthy problem. Yeah. yeah. I, I have some others that probably aren't so healthy. So how do you decide <laughs> what you're going to, how do you decide what you're going to keep? Oh man, that that's tough because I give away a lot, like a lot, like a lot. We yeah. we do a, a massive amount of giveaways a month, um, and I love it. I love doing it. I love giving stuff away. So, uh, but I usually keep. This is one way how I think about it too, and and this is a little bit more business sided. Is is it good for the channel? 
Is it good for the channel? Can I use it over and over? Is it something I can affiliate link? Things like that, you know, and I know that that sounds a little bit more business-esque more than knife collector, but I have to think of it like that to keep yeah. the channel, you know, flowing. But I usually do it whether or not I, this is something I recommend. Like, I don't keep something that I don't want to recommend and then recommend it. If it's something right, right. I love and I know I'm going to want to recommend it and I know I can link it and I know people are going to love it and I know it's something that's going to be timeless that I, I 100% want to keep it. <clears throat> yeah, right. That, that makes sense. I mean, it is, you are running a business. You went full time with this channel. Yes. Um, and so you, you, you have a responsibility to, to think of it as a business because it yeah. is. What has that been like? How, what was it like to take that plunge and what have you learned? Well, um, I mean, I guess, you know, learning because growing up, I, you know, I did construction and I ran construction sites and things like that, but I never really learned the business aspect of how to run a business legitly because, you know, it was always under the table stuff. And even when it was legit, it wasn't as legit as I am now. So, you know, I have to think about the taxes and all the little details. I have to think about my overhead and, you know, where, where, where I'm losing money or gaining money. How, like, what kind of expense can I have? And will I get a return on it? Because some knives, you know, if like, if I buy a knife and in a year I don't wind up making enough on it, then that, then that was kind of a bad purchase. So I have to think about mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but it's doing very well. The business is doing very well. So, so I'm very happy where we're at and very happy with the way it's growing. You uh, you seem to have a real knack for it. I, you put out a video that I studied <laughs> uh, uh, pretty diligently. Um, and, and actually, it has shown a, a little bit of returns on on, uh, on my end. But um, sure. you you did a video on, on following the um, analytics of your channel. Yeah. It's there. Mm -hmm. It's a tool for you to discover and, and strategize. And uh, you did a great video on that. Yeah. And I think that that was a, that was a great service. Yeah. I, um, I also did one with Ray. Um, we've done this a couple of times and I'm going to, I'm going to have Ray on my podcast or on my channel again, really soon. But we've, we talked a lot about that and he brought me on and was asking me like the things that I've done. And I've told this to everybody and I'll say it again here. If anybody ever wants to, help or want to know exactly what I do down to a T. I have no problem helping them, giving them tips, tricks, whatever, whatever I can um, help with. And also, and I've said this too, because I know I get a lot of kickback people thinking I'm like buying subs and stuff. I've left it very open that I will show you 100% my analytics and yes. everything I do. So that, that buying subs thing, that's not real. People don't I know, buy, you know, I, but, but I like to be an open book about it. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's sour grapes. And when yeah. you were talking about Ray, I think you were talking about ED, uh, um, everyday city uh, carry, everyday yes, city sorry, carry. Sorry, yeah. He's so cool, man. And his, yeah. his, uh, his sorry, ASMR sorry. videos are just yeah. mouthwatering. I, I hate to put it that way, but they're, they're really awesome. And uh, but he, he's really right now, um, because it's take, it took him a little bit longer to catch some steam. But right now he's starting to catch some steam. He's doing it full time and you can really tell it's starting to pay off for him. So I applaud him, man. He's putting in yeah. a lot of work. He, yeah. And the, okay. So, so this, this is a big part of why people come to channels like yours, channels mm -hmm. like Ray's, uh, is that whether or not you're watching a video about a knife you're interested in buying, you like the person. And you like hearing their voice and you like yeah. hearing their take on things. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the same reason why I listen to certain news podcasts or certain, you right. know, certain other things. And you can it's relate. Just, yeah. You know, yeah. and that's a good thing to do. You know, it's good to relate with the person because sometimes you can have five channels or five people doing the exact same thing, but you relate with this one a little bit more, maybe their personality, maybe their humor, something, right? And mm -hmm. then that makes that one stand out a little bit more than maybe the three others that are almost identical. So yeah, yeah. And and I would say that um that people liking your personality and Kara's personality and your uh your dynamics together mm -hmm. is uh you know a big part of your draw. I mean when I met you both in person at uh, Blade Show, that was mm -hmm. awesome. First of all, I yeah. had a great time no, hanging great. out. You but going again in, this year? Oh yeah, yeah. All right, I'll see you there. Yes, indeed. Um, but to, to to be around the two of you in person was kind of like being around the two of you on screen. Yeah. I felt immediately comfortable. Uh -huh. And there's there's something to that, you know. You have to be willing 
to go out a little bit further than you might be comfortable. You have yeah. to show your face. I mean, yes. Maybe you don't have to. That's that is not a prerequisite. I think it helps because people relate helps. to other people's faces. But look right. at Nick Shabazz. He mm -hmm. he. But but he's got a great mind. So you got to have something. Very lucky with the way yes. he does. Yes. Because I don't think that that's typical. I, I think he's gotten very lucky. He showed up in a time when it, there was no other channels. So I think that helped him a lot. I love Nick Shabazz. I love what he does. I think he does it great. But I think for the most part, people like to see a face to see if they can. It's almost like a trust thing, you know. Yeah. Can I trust what you're saying? Can I trust, you know, your your beliefs in this or whatever? And I think people do trust Nick. But I don't think that'll go the same way with a lot of other people if they're not willing to to show their hand a little bit, right? Yeah, Even like yeah. your personality, like you said, that's a huge, huge thing. Because if I meet you, I don't need you meeting me and then telling everybody, oh, he's nothing like he is on camera. Yeah, right. Like, I, I promise you, if you meet me, it's going to be 100% exactly what you get. It's no same, different. Same. Hey, Kara, it's a pleasure to see you. Good to Hi. see you. I, uh, and I was, popped in because I heard you guys talking about showing faces, which was something in the beginning of this channel that I pushed hard. Yeah. I, I And I think you were so used to seeing tabletop that you didn't, mm -hmm. you originally didn't think people would like it. Well, I didn't want, I didn't think people would like not being able to see exactly what you're talking about up close. So that was a huge thing to me as I wanted to make it as clear as possible because there were some people doing face stuff and that was my was complaint with rare, that. Though. No, I mean. There were there were a little I, bit I see but... many many more knife channels now Doing showing their faces yeah. than yeah. I did yeah. three years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Like, yeah. I'm not saying we started that. I'm a lot of were that's table top, what I table see. Top. Yeah, they were all tabletop, and sure. I. Remember that was the one thing I was like, we're doing, we're not doing just straight tabletop. Even if you just do the intro with your face, mm -hmm. you can yes. show the knife up close for the rest of the time. That's fine, but like. If you can get people attached to who you are, like you were just saying, that's a really big part of things. And ever since like reality TV and all that stuff came out being very fake yeah. and the news, everything is just kind of bleh, fake, you know? So that's why on people YouTube, want to see real realness and people became very popular. There's even studies that show that like, you know, your little logo, like how ours is NK and you have, you know, mm -hmm. up here in the corner, the, the, that they, yep. they even have done studies that show if that is a face, you get more clicks on your channel. Now oh, we don't want to change ours just because it's synonymous, and I just people feel like it. people yeah. know it at this point. Yeah. But it, it, they've done clear cut studies that channels get more clicks when it is a face in that mm -hmm. circle. Look, so, look for the new knife junkie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. But anyway, I have to go mail a bunch of knives. I just wanted to pop in and say right. hi. Hey, I'm glad you did, and and I just want to say one thing before you leave. I, I would also say, uh, kind of in line with what you were saying, these days people are more atomized due to lifestyle, due to family setups and due to social media and the phone obsession. And, 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 and so I think people are maybe a little bit more lonely than they ever have before. Yeah. So if they can check in daily with the Neves or, or with Stasa or, or whomever they like, you know, uh, I think that's yeah. a big draw too. Yeah, for sure. And we make a humongous effort to answer people. Like yeah. I spend most of my work day answering people like not just companies or i go and do too i go and do too i take a couple does, i do a couple hours i probably out of my day. handle more of the business interactions but jared and i both spend a long time you know answering questions and if there is a question that i don't want to answer because it's about sharpening i just get his exact words and be like hey this is kara but here's what jared said you know like we but there are many times i go on there like even today for this i was yeah, on there no, I, I go every day do. every yeah every day i spend yeah. a couple hours answering but the point messages. is is that as a team we make a big effort we're able to do it <laughs> to communicate <laughs> we're not able to do it otherwise. every like almost every single person that reaches out do you almost. do you have that knife for indiana nice yeah. yes okay but um he sent it to the email Okay. Go, go thing. All right. Well, I'm going to go handle that. And, Kara, uh, I'll, I'll great see you to later. See you. All right. Bye. Take care. Thanks for dropping in. Um, uh, I want to talk about the sharpening too, but, but before yeah. we do, I, I want to continue with this idea about community. You have um, on your YouTube channel, you can join your YouTube channel uh, yeah. as, as a member. As a and, member. You, and, and you've created a, a what's kind of organically formed uh, the, the bang gang. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the name. I think it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, people have all, used, in some cases, people say it backwards and it's not as good. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but um, really, really uh, 
great sort of community feel there and you and you show things you you talk about sharpening and you mm -hmm. you give demos uh tell me a little bit about that so what i do is twice a month i do a live for the members the members so like this sunday we have a live it's at 12 15 so um, if you're a member, we do live sharpening. And if you are a top tier member, you can request for a one on one, meaning like I will literally do basically the same thing I do live, but with just you there, nobody else there. So if there's yeah, things cool. you need help with or you need to show me something, we can do it together. Um, but otherwise, the like I try, I leave it open for anybody to watch, but only the members can join. So like only members can communicate and things like that. And then also we do giveaways on there. Like even this Sunday, I have um, a set of stones, some some Japanese water stones we're going to give away. Um, we give away knives, sharpening devices, sharpening supplies. I try to help them like with people like if they are a member and they say, oh man, I don't have a strop or this or that, I'll figure out a way to get them a strop. So I try to make it to where people are able to learn and be involved in sharpening so that even if it takes a year or something for them to get really good at it, which it is, it matters how much time you put in. So the more time you put in, the easier and faster it'll be, but it makes it to where they have a place. They have a place to learn to, to work with somebody because even me, when I first started, I would try to contact people that had channels that did sharpening content, but it was very difficult to, to get the information correctly and, you know, really communicate with them. So I mean, I try to make it easy for people. I know, uh, uh Emler had, Mike Emler had, uh, some influence on your, on your sharpening. Definitely, your free. Yes. Um, yeah, he's a good guy and he does great work. Um, but I, I love the fact that you use, uh, I mean, you were, you were kind of coming on to, the scene i don't know how to put it but like you the fact that you had some some prowess at sharpening was coming to the fore when a lot of people were doing this with the wicked edge and and i know the wicked edge will give you a wicked edge i just yeah you know i don't know i i think i like the idea of using a stone i just use a triangle sharp maker and a strop um and pretty well, much there, i don't use my knives that much anyway so there's so many different devices and yeah. stones and techniques and there's like there's always going to be one that suits you the best and for what your use is whether that is just honing and stropping maintaining your edge and then when it finally does need a full sharpening you send it to somebody that's fine too you know as long as your knives are sharp that's what's important so but anybody can learn it. And then there are, luckily, there are devices that make it super easy where they'll, they'll hold the angle. All you got to do is move the stone and understand. You still have to have an understanding of the scratch pattern and creating a bevel. But it's it's easier if something's holding the angle for you, for sure. Right, right. I got a KME a few years ago and I used it a few times. And I don't know. Uh, I just I kind of put it away a little mm -hmm. bit. I feel like I reprofiled a couple of knives, changed yeah. the silhouette a little bit. And yeah. I was like, yeah. Uh, so uh, you got to practice for sure. A yeah. The bit, idea you know? was to get a bunch of cheap knives and practice. And then I, I just I kind of <laughs> didn't do that. But but uh, the way you sharpen uh, using, you know, on a um, on a stone, using your finger and your thumb as guides. That's what mm -hmm. my grandfather used to do. So right. like, yeah. So to me, that resonates. Um, and he also used to go in a circular motion, but he, for chisels and stuff, but mm -hmm. he would always use his thumb and his finger as guides uh, right. to, to hold the angle. Yeah. And, yeah. and when you showed that off, you know, a couple of years ago now, I, I thought that was so cool because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an old school way of doing things that works in a day and age where you have a quicker solution with the, with the yeah. wicked edge. Well, people's hardest thing with freehanding is once they pick the knife up, they, they're they unable to put it right back down at the same angle. So what will happen is, is every time they pick it up, they set it down at a little bit higher, a little bit lower. So now when they go across the stone, the scratch pattern is completely different. So it makes it to where you can set it back down and 100% be at the exact same angle that you just lift it off from. Now, another way to, to make sure that you have the same angle is to every time you put it down, do not do less than like 20 strokes. So the reason mm -hmm. why, and you can go back and forth. You don't have to just push it forward. You can go back and forth because some people, it's easier for them to hold their angle as long as they don't lift the blade off the stone. Mm -hmm. But you go back and forth 20 times. And the reason why is because just doing it once or twice might be a different angle and different scratch pattern on a microscopic level. 
but in the big scheme of things, it's going to make be making you change your angle constantly. Doing 20 swipes will ensure that once you, if you did start a barely, barely little bit of a different angle, it's going to, the whole edge will be that new angle now before you lift back up. Yeah. And eventually that makes sense. Yes, it totally does. And you'll get sensitive enough to actually feel when you're yes. flat, flat yep. on the surface, when that yep. tiny little edge. Mm-hmm. It so just takes about, a little bit of time. It's like riding a bike, you know? Yeah. 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 These are skills like, um, you know, Joe Rogan always says uh, it's, it's important to pick up difficult things, you yes. know, and, and I, try I, and master them at I one level or another. More. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it stretches you. It, it, um, you know, it makes you smarter too. I seen, uh, Joe, speaking of Joe Rogan, I heard, I seen he was carrying a crooked river, a bench made crooked river. Oh, really? Yeah. And he had, cool. he had he had the premium one. Oh, of course. Well, with the Damascus and stuff. Yeah, it looked yeah. really good. Yeah. He also uh, uh, has a couple of half face blades. I know, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm always whenever they He's a nice collector to, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Whenever they cut to the wide shot, I'm always looking on his desk. Like, Me too. To, everyone's going. <laughs> And same thing with Jocko Willink. He always has a knife on his yep, desk, too. Yep. <laughs> what does he got? What yeah. does he got? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, besides the regular sort of V edges, the V ground edges that you're uh, adept at, obviously, what do you think of other grinds? Um, do you have? Do you like knives with apple seed edges, uh, convex edges, um, you know, other kind of things? Well, I teach. So the way I teach my convex edge is I teach to hold the stone in hand. And the reason why is because... And now, and when you do it, you're trying to hold the angle perfectly. You're not trying to convex. All you're trying to do is just hold the stone, hold the knife, hold the angle perfectly and go across. But because your hand is going to move a little bit like this, in many cases, you can just leave the blade alone and just move the stone. But because they're mm-hmm. kind of both moving at the same time, it will automatically convex your edge. And to me, that's the easiest fastest and best way to convex an edge when you're freehanding so yeah i like to teach it all i like to teach all different different methods for even to get the same effect different methods because some people are going to be better at one thing than another but yeah it's good to, to know all different types of sharpening and that's just something that keeps comes with experience you know you should learn something master it and then move on to something different yeah 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 the um uh i've had issues before where i've had a knife that's been so old or maybe i found a knife from my childhood and i wanted to put a proper edge on it mm-hmm. and it's like god where do i start because i don't have uh you know so what i've done in the past is sandpaper you know put sandpaper in varying grits down on a flat surface yep. and then and uh eventually uh, get that i will i will admit i did that not like more than two weeks ago because yeah. it was cold and I didn't feel I have a, a grinder in the shed that I could have gone out to, but it works. Know, it works. It works. And so. just something as simple as sandpaper, mm-hmm. you know, well, I think so, it's also good because like, even with like regular stones, natural stones, things like that, because if you're in the field, most likely these are going to be the tools you're going to have at hand. So yeah. know how to use them. Right. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's always been Ernest Emerson's, uh, justification for the chisel edge. You know, he does yeah. some chis- chisel ground blades mm-hmm. and then, and then they all have that chisel edge. What do you think of that? So I like it. I think one, it makes it to where you can have a more robust edge that slices really, really good because you can have a lower angle. Um, like I actually have, uh, one here somewhere. <laughs> I thought I had it sitting here somewhere, but it's an Emerson, uh, the, the a 100 and, oh, yeah. but, and I love it and it's chisel ground, but I lowered back the edge angle even farther than what it comes with. And man, that thing is razor sharp and it cuts really good, but you wouldn't expect it because of the geometry. It has robust, thick geometry. Some people would say almost too thick of geometry, mm-hmm. but because of that chisel edge, it makes it to a one. You can sharpen it easily in the field or not because it's 154 cm and two it's gonna cut really good and it's gonna be nice and tough in the same breath so yeah that's always been my my point it's uh their chisel edges can be so extremely sharp it's half of what you what you already have with a v ground edge yeah you, know, you get and uh oh yeah i, re- I remember seeing this a couple of days yeah, ago is. and you can see i got um if it'll come up i got a nice low angle on there you can see some spots right there that i got yeah. messed up but um but yeah, no, it's a nice low angle. So this thing is, it's screaming sharp. There's a couple nicks in my edge, but uh, but besides that, though, man, this is a great knife. 
like so it. 154 I cm 154 cm is oh it's also an incidental front flipper all of the emersons you can kind yeah. of front flip. Yeah. um but so 154 cm has always been one of my favorite uh steels i i love it it's mm -hmm. very you know it's not too flashy um but you can keep it real sharp you can get it real sharp and with the kind of use i put on my knives it's, it's not like it dulls quickly or anything what are your favorite steels and why so if we're going to go budget then 14c and nitro v because 14c 28 and the nitro v are very similar so they have the same attributes that i love in steels they have they're well-rounded easy to sharpen and they take an incredibly sharp edge especially at low angles and high polished edges. So if you like polished mm -hmm. edges, they take a good polished edge and they hold it fairly well. Also 14 C was, it evolved from AEBL, which is, was originally made for razor blades. And it was made to heat treat basically on a conveyor belt to where the heat treat process would be very easy. And so you can guarantee when you get a 14 C 28 N steel, that it's heat treated well because it's so easy. It's hard for them to mess up. And it has a wide range of HRC. Obviously, the higher the HRC, the more edge retention. So we want to see it on the higher side. But if it is a little bit on the lower side, it's not going to be a bad steel like some steels would be. Also, um, I love crew wear for that exact same reason. Crew wears um, a, a steel that takes and holds a really, really good fine edge. Now, it's like the exact opposite of Maximet, where Maximet holds a really good toothy edge, or sorry, a really good mm -hmm. working edge for a long time. So, like, if I was going to say, like, what a working edge and fine edge is, yeah. one would be, like, hair shaving, working edge would be slicing through paper, right? MagnaCut, or sorry, Maximet holds a working edge for a super long time, but it doesn't hold a fine edge for very long. Oh. Crewware holds a fine edge for a very long time, but it doesn't hold a working edge very long. So, it's like the exact opposite. <laughs> My absolute favorite steel is K390 right now. I love mm. K390. I also recently got to try, um, which which it's new, but the, the Triple B's 15V. I'm trying, that, oh, I'm loving that stuff. That stuff is really good. And then if Magna Cut's heat treated properly, it is incredible. But it, but it has to be heat treated properly. As long as it's between 63, 64 HRC, oh my goodness, is it great. Like some of the stuff I've tested, night and day difference from like the stuff at 60 to like 63 oh, really? oh my goodness it's so the way it sharpens the way it takes an edge the way it holds it everything across the board so do you have to um sharpen the steel to be able to evaluate it fully i, I would imagine that's a big yeah. part of it for you yeah because it, like i can't go off of a factory edge a factory edge if you have a factory edge and it goes dull fast that doesn't mean anything because one that it could be burnt Two, maybe they didn't put a proper edge on it. Maybe they didn't deburr properly. There's so Wait, ex many factors. Explain, explain the burnt thing. Burnt steel. So what, when they put it on a belt and they're sharpening on a belt, the belt heats the edge up higher than what it's heat treated at. And mm. automatically that's going to burn the steel. So right there at the edge, it's going to be burnt. That doesn't mean the blade is burnt. It doesn't mean you can't fix it. It just means it, ha it needs a few sharpenings to remove that burnt steel right at the edge, right at the apex to to get into good steel and usually that's within two three sharpenings you'll get into good steel so that was it's zt different. with l max when they first came out with l max that was happening a lot right exactly mm -hmm. yes um their s35 too they did they, 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 i actually got oh, one really? from zt that was so bad um it took a lot of sharpenings to get rid of the burnt steel so it was like burnt really really bad and i don't think that that was typical it just you know happened to me so is that something you can see or you just feel it as you're sharpening a little bit or of as both. you're using so you, it you can see it, but if you don't see it, that doesn't mean it's not there. So, like, if you mm -hmm. look at your edge and you see browning, like browning, especially like near the tip, you'll see it bluing, browning. That mm -hmm. usually means it's burnt. Um, now, if that you don't see that, that doesn't mean it's not. But what one thing I can really tell is when I'm sharpening, I'll go from the steel feeling soft on the stone to all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it'll be skating across the stone, which mm. means I've gotten into harder steel. So that means the steel previous to that was not as hard as the steel now. And it's it's a huge indicator. You can feel it right away. Now, when you're, <clears throat> when you're using your knife, if the knife is going dull really quick, in many cases, that's because it, it's burnt. Now, it can be your fault too. Like you didn't deburr properly, something you did wrong. But in many cases, if you're really good at that and you know you sharpened it properly, you know it's a properly sharpened edge and it goes dull a lot quicker than it should, 
That doesn't mean the, the steel's bad. That just means it might need to be sharpened a few times. Like even with Outpost 76, just for an example, when he does sharpening, sometimes he'll sharpen like four times and he'll tell you the edge retention difference. And from the first sharpening to like the fourth sharpening, in some cases, it'll jump up uh, sometimes even up to like 50% more. So, you know, sometimes it's not that much, but in other cases it is like, it, it's a crazy jump from one sharpening. Say if it sharp, say if it cut a hundred feet of cardboard, well then after the fourth sharpening, it's cutting 200 feet. So, hmm. so I guess the optimistic way of looking at it is improved performance, <laughs> but you don't want to start there. You don't want to have to remove right. steel to get that performance. Well, you can also tell a huge thing off of the burr. So the way an edge comes up with the burr, the way it removes. So like if it's well heat treated, the burr will be easily removed. And also like how it pops off. So like there's times where when I deburr, the burr will come off as an entire wire or a couple chunks of wire. So and the I can really the part that the burr is the part that folds <clears throat> over as you're sharpening, right? It gets real yes, thin yeah. that it okay. It's a wire, so when you're sharpening this side of the, the edge, it'll start going like this, and then this is the, the wire that's on the apex. So you want to do this again, and then once you get to your final burr, you want to make the burr go back and forth, fold it back, like kind of like a, um, a paper clip, folding it back and forth, mm -hmm. and then it'll pop off. And that's what you want. Oh. You want it to pop off completely. <clears throat> okay. But if it's soft, if it's soft, like a paper clip, it'll bend back and forth <laughs> A hundred times. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. But when it's hard, it'll go whop, whop, and snap right off. And you can always, you can tell very easily. Like there's times, like I said, my my stone, I'll see the actual wire sitting on my stone, and I can tell this stuff's heat treated very well. Wow, that is well, that's a tip right there, and not to mm -hmm. not to uh, uh, do a commercial for your channel, but that's something that you could learn. <laughs> well, I will do a commercial for you. I that's appreciate it. <laughs> you could learn by going onto your channel and watching these sharpening videos because mm -hmm. I've always heard of the burr and I know what it is, but I, it never was quite explained to me that way um, mm -hmm. uh, and how it relates to the heat treat. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, I, I want to ask you, I'm looking at, at your feed right here and that little best tech is coming to me soon. I can't wait to check that out. But what yeah. are the things you see everything you get a chance to experience like almost everything and you get different versions of everything what are you looking forward to what do you what do you really love right now that's out and then what are you looking forward to you know in the offing this year well one thing i i really love is i love being able to find great values so something that's done well across the board you know in the little details for a good price because People don't want to spend an arm and a leg to get good quality. So they want to get the best bang for their buck. So I love doing that. But then I also love, I love my titanium frame locks and super steels. I'm a, I'm a steel nut. So I love the steels. I love well, <clears throat> properly heat treated knives. And this is the thing, man, when you get a knife and you know the difference between a, a properly heat treated knife versus a non you start despising non like stuff that's not heat treated well because of the way it comes up with the, its edge, but the way it deburs, the type of edge it has, how well it holds it, all these little details because you hate to spend 300 bucks and then find out like, man, this stuff sucks, you know? And, and especially if you know how to sharpen, because now you're spending the time to put that, that really nice edge on there. So when you get a steel that man, this stuff sharpens up so good, takes such a good edge. It's so easy and blah, blah, blah. It makes you feel good about your purchase, you know, and yes. you don't, you're not afraid to use it. You're not afraid to use it because now it's like, it's going to hold its edge. And when I go to resharpen it, it's going to sharpen up really good. Um, but yeah. And like I said, those little details, I love finding knives that have the little details knocked out of the park. So any names, can you name names? What are you excited about? Well, things from Riet. I'm always excited about things from Riet. but right now tactile, like I was saying before, tactile's oh, yeah. got some great stuff coming. I love seeing anything that's coming out of the U.S. I love seeing. Um, right now, I got you know some issues with some of the the more affordable USA made knife companies. I don't think that they're doing anything any or us any justice at all. But as far as like Spiderco, I love seeing Spiderco come out with new stuff. Any new design mm -hmm. from them, uh, I'm all for. The military Ho too. <laughs> Hogs, Hogs do a really good job. You, I know you just seen CRKT just did two designs yeah. with Hogue. Yeah, um, I do think they're overpriced, but whatever. They're at least USA made. I'm happy for them. You know, make yeah. your money, whatever it takes. Um, but I do think they are overpriced. 
Um, I, this is a little thing, like little stuff like this. And I know this is like going off the rails, but I think oh, this thing yes. is so wickedly cool. I yeah. love things like this. It's different. It's unique. It, it's kind of special. You don't see it every day. And damn it, is this thing brutal. This thing does damage. It's crazy. I had, um, I have this leather that's uh, two millimeters thick. So mm. cowhide leather, way thicker yeah. than our skin. And I wrapped it around cardboard. And I was slashing it. And when you see how much damage this thing does, you realize like what would what it would do to somebody, right? And I'm not advocating for violence or anything. I'm just saying, like, not. in a situation where somebody's on top of you or something, this is not gonna have any problem getting it off. And I said in the video the other day, one slash with this on an arm is gonna be life threatening, 100 yes. percent Hold hold that up for a quick second. This yep. is the Strelit. Uh it's, yep. Strelit. it's yeah, sorry. A Strelit. It's designed by um uh, Ostop Hell, right? This is yep. Ostop. Yep. yep. And 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 chances are you will never use it for a slashing push dagger. Right. And it's got a wave too. And so if you don't you've got this incredibly unique, beautifully designed by a designer. You know what I mean? That makes a difference to me. You've got this incredible yeah. pocket tool that's unique and different that you yeah. could also turn into a, you know, a, 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 a tool of mayhem if need be. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the cool thing about exploring all these knives, it, these brilliant designs. Look at that thing. That's beautiful. I've yeah, had one sitting in my cart for a while, and I think I'm going to go for it. After oh, this you should go for it. You're going to love it if you do. Um, I'm thinking about getting the premium version because I love it so much. Because, like well, you said, mentioned in your video that 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 the premium version would be even better because it's a frame yep. lock and you can yes. reinforce that. Yes, and that, and yeah, because you can squeeze the lock stronger. Now yeah. I've tested this and I haven't had even close to anything failing. And I've hit wood. I've scratched through really thick cardboard, the leather. Um, I've actually tested it quite a bit and it's been great. So I've even spine whacked it a little bit just to make sure because you don't want it folding mm -hmm. on you. Now, mm -hmm. if it happened to, it's going to, what it's going to do, it's going to go down and go right back up. So I don't think anything will happen. I think it'll just come out of lockup and then go right back to lockup because your finger is going to stop it and lock it back up. So, right. but still though, nobody wants the risk of failing. So I think a frame lock is the better way to go. But yeah, I love that it's different. I love that it's not the same thing over and over. It's unique. Yeah. It's it's kind of special. And, you know, it is pretty useful, you know. And I love, I like things like that, you know. And there's a lot of other, like, I love just great working knives. I love knives that are kind of um, purposed. Like, they, they have a specific purpose they're trying to go mm -hmm. for. But then yeah. I also like versatile tools, tools that are made to be, you know, whatever you want to make it, right? Like, it's going to, even like like this the oh man i can't even think of the name of this do you remember the name of this i just oh, got it. no but that's a that's a little conico it's something having to do with star or sky Sarah, or... what's the name of this new artist and i just got the andromedas <laughs> see i knew it had something to do with space <laughs> <laughs> so this thing it's neutral ergos like i was talking about earlier i love neutral ergos because they're good in any grip and then it's got somewhat of a spear point blade so it's going to be a versatile blade shape and you know it's just really cool so this is a great edc knife and could it be a good beautiful knife? i don't know but it's still you know it's shaped to do the purpose you know it's a beautiful <laughs> knife and in the right hands or in the with the right uh, or wrong situation yeah of course it could be. Uh, you know, um, uh, I, I want to do a speed round with you. Everyone who reviews yep. knives, I like to do a speed round. But before we do that, I want to ask you yep. this question. And um, uh, it comes up every now and again, I think. And 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 it comes up with my own, with, with the title, with the tides of my own collection. Like right now, I'm coming out of a huge, big fixed Bowie phase. And I'm not sure where I'm probably going into a dagger phase. I don't know. But mm -hmm. when I'm out of something like, say, titanium frame locks, I might yeah. think something like, have we hit peak knife? Is there anything new that can happen with titanium frame locks that will really get me excited? Um, I think so. Yeah? Okay. I tell agree. me Tell me why. So I think, and I'm not saying this is in the works, so don't think I'm think, saying that, but I think that they could evolve the compression lock. And if we start seeing titanium used, because where is there titanium compression lock knives? Mm. There isn't, unless if you modify it, right? You can modify your spider goes, but I think that that's going to be something we're going to start seeing. And I think they could, and I've like designed it in my head where, you know, the, the CME from OCD for EDC, right? The yep. CME that go on yep. the compression locks. Uh -huh. Think about if that was just all one system. 
you know, I think if we did see that with titanium, I think that that would be super innovative. I think uh, new locking mechanisms, period. We Right now, yeah. the um, uh, the the MSI, right, from Microtech? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Stitch, that, their new right. lock. The, what's it? What's it? What I forget what's called the but rock lock. It's, it's their sort of bar lock, right? It's the sliding, yeah, yeah, the backsliding. Yeah. I can't remember I what they call the it, but they call it. But stuff like that, man, that that's awesome to see stuff like yeah. that. So if it, and if it has titanium on it, even titanium frame locks, just good old titanium frame locks. When we see new materials with inlay work and you know great blade shapes and grinds, like if I see a titanium frame lock come out and I see it has a, a deep, tall, broad, hollow grind, mm -hmm. oh man, I'm sold. <laughs> right, I'm trying right. to grab two of them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't have to be, I guess, I guess what you're getting at is it doesn't have to be some crazy feat of engineering, although that's always cool to see too. Yeah. But just just subtle, sure. subtle differences in combinations could could mm -hmm. keep things going. And and obviously well, I'm never wait, losing. Wait, think about him, what he's doing right now. Oh my God. Yeah, amazing. I, yes. Yeah, um, amazing. And you know, it's not just his knives that are cool. He had this magnetic spike launcher, wrist mounted magnetic spike launcher that he had on his channel. I was like, oh, I want one. When are you selling these, man? <laughs> Next to my flamethrower. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, did you see what uh, the guy who designed the Riot exoskeleton? Did you see what he's got coming? No. A locking one, so one that's gonna have a lock on it. Oh. So it's it, because everybody complains about it being able to open up. It's yeah. gonna have a lock on it, and he also has a karambit version coming mm. that mm. looks really, really cool. I got to get an EXO in my life. I don't know why. It, there's so many knives, man. So many know. knives, I know. and and that one deserves to be in this room. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I deserve <laughs> to have one. that knife. I think is what I'm yeah, saying. I love it. All right, Jared. It's going to be really uh, cool seeing the Crambit version of it. You know, So that's an incredibly illegal knife. Uh, yeah, because... in a lot of places. Some places it's not, though. Because of this silly gravity knife thing uh, that's that's still in a lot of knife laws from yeah. like 1923 or whenever it was written. Yeah. But, okay, so so speed round here. Let, I'm going to yes. find out. We're all going to find out your tastes in about 16 questions. And, right. uh, and, and I might... I might alter them as we go just to just to be more relevant, but probably not. No problem. Go. Okay. First, fixed or folder? Depends on for what the folder. Mm, no, no, no. Folder. <laughs> fixed or folder. <laughs> folder. Okay. <laughs> Flipper or thumb stud? Thumb stud. Okay. Washers or bearings? Bearings. Tip up or tip down? Oh well, tip up. Okay. Tonto or Bowie? Ooh, that's a good one. Depends on what kind of Bowie, but I'm going to go uh, Bowie. Okay. Spearpoint or Warncliffe? Oh, Spearpoint. Okay. I thought I love maybe the Warncliffe, with... though. Yeah, I know, because you like those, the tip down low and those. Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah, I do. Right. Okay. So full size or small? Full size. Hollow ground or flat ground? Hollow. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Tactical. Automatic or Bally song? Automatic. Riot or Reich? Riot. Uh, Benchmade or Spyderco? Spyderco. Civivi or Kaiser? Ooh. <laughs> Civivi, Civivi. Okay, milled titanium or spring clip? Milled, milled. I, I like the way they're doing the balance right now where they have some milled uh, deep carry, right? Like this. Yeah. It's a yeah. milled deep carry clip that's also yeah. like a spring clip. Um, Dude, I think like Arcane is doing that too. Ever. Oh, cool. Uh, so uh, let's see. Carbon fiber or micarta? Micarta, yeah. Finger choil or no choil? Choil. Give me that choil. All right. Now we're getting meta. Form or function? Oh, function. function. All right. And then lastly, this is the one knife you get to keep for the rest of your life. You got to get rid of everything else. It's your desert oh, island shit. knife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Manix 2. Spyderco Manix 2. Wow. First of all, that seems like a really good answer, but I'm I'm really impressed by how quickly you came up with that. And you've got the one with the, you have one with a titanium handle, I think, right? I have That's a couple. Probably... Yeah. Okay. I think the XL 
is one of the best XL knives out there. If you never have tried the, the, the Manix XL, it is an amazing XL knife. It's tough lock. And this is one thing I like about it. And this is why I picked it. I'll explain it perfectly. The locking mechanism that they do on that is made to be opened and closed, open and closed, open and closed. So if I'm fidgeting with it, I'm not wearing out the lock like I would be on a frame lock or a liner lock. It's made to be do doing that. I've never felt a Manix that has blade rock at all. And I've held a lot of them. Beat up ones, old ones, all of them have strong lockup because of the way the lock's designed. So it's a lock that's made to be used over and over and over for long periods of time with still strong. And it's a very strong lock. Um, it makes it fidgety. So it has the fidget factor, yeah. the, the longevity, the lockup strength. And then Spyderco does the best heat treats out there for production knives. It, that's what I've heard from. That's what I've heard from everyone. They're doing so, the past two years, especially the past two years. They have been just knocking it out of the park with their heat treats. They actually care and are focusing on that heavily. So, and I got to applaud that because a lot of other companies are not. Well, uh, on that note, speaking of knocking it out of the park, Jared, it's so cool to to watch your channel grow. But it's even cooler just to watch your channel. I love your I love your videos, I and uh, you and Kara are are top notch folks so uh thanks again for coming on the show yep. and uh and for those of you oh my pleasure as always and and for those of you who are patrons uh we'll have a couple extra minutes of conversation with jared coming up jared thanks again sir adios don't take dull for an answer it's the knife junkies favorite sign off phrase and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long sleeve tee and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a knife junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at the knifejunkie.com/dull and shop for all of your knife junkies merchandise at the knifejunkie.com/shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Jared Neve of Neve's Knives. Man, I could talk to that guy about knives forever. Uh, very interesting and knowledgeable dude. And if you want to talk to him about knives, go join his channel. Uh, become a part of the Bang Gang. Wanted to say that right. And uh, and like he said, you can even, if you're top tier, you can even have a one-on-one -on -one sharpening session with Jared. So super cool. All right. Uh, be sure to join us next week for another awesome conversation. And of course, Wednesday for the Wednesday midweek supplemental where I get to uh, wax poetic about my knife collection and the new things coming out. And of course, Thursday Night Knives at 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time right here live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Until next time, I'd like to say for Jim, doing his magic behind the switcher as always, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.